history is a pretty important one and it's also more approachable than any of the things that we've discussed, including culture. Culture is quite complex, but history is easier because there is one you know, there is one message in the history, and some of the readings actually discuss this. What is the message that, what do we learn from the history of borders, right? I think there is one message which is really, in a way, interesting because, um, okay, because um, there are so many historians that have studied borders, right, that we can ask ourselves, basically, what do we learn from historians that have studied borders? Um, and um, I'm going to get to this. The way I've organized the, my talk today is that I'm going to remind very briefly all of you what the big program is about, Borders and Globalization, two slides. And then I'm going to talk to you about my own reading of the evolution of the modern history of borders and how we understand what, what we are dealing with today. What is a boundary line today versus a border of a frontier, basically. And then I'm going to discuss two of the readings. Um, one that discusses frontier in the medieval time, which I think is very interesting. And the other one that discusses the borders of the mind, or borders in the mind, right? Which I think is also really interesting um, because it raises more conceptual issues that we're dealing with at, um, head first in borders and globalization. Um, and I might last maybe half an hour or 45 minutes, we'll see. Usually. I speak more than I intend to. But we should have some time for discussions. And if the seminar doesn't go for the full two hours, well, all the better for us, right? It frees everybody for their assignments, especially, right? <laughs> if it's due tomorrow at 9. So uh, and, and don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have questions as I go, although, um, yeah. So. Um, Borders and globalization. We have basically, we're, what we're looking at is basically understanding, in a way, two phenomena that are affecting territories today, or affecting states today. One has to do, and I call them the two logics, states and territories and the flow and connectivity. Um, and the issue here is to understand one, the, the state and territorial question, which is, why is it then today, when we look at the history of states, we have an increasing number of states worldwide? Sometime one new state a year, sometime no new states, but the appearance of contestation within existing states. And I'll just remind you the most Western contemporary one is the case of Catalonia recently, right? But it's just the one that we know in the media in the Western world. It's not what is happening around the world. And the other one is the fact that, and uh, that it's not just a fact, is that we have to understand movement, connectivity, market flow, and, and mobility better. One of which is, and the contemporary example is, migration in, into the European Union, which is increasing again this year a little bit after being really stable for almost two years. Uh, but so we, we go from one crisis to another. And that's only, again, the Western, um, the Western example, because if we look at other places around the world, for instance, if we look at Colombia, there are new uh, issues. In Brazil, there are new issues and so on and so forth. So we have this mobility, human mobility around the world, which is actually um, not really increasing in, in um, proportion of the overall world population, but certainly increasing in numbers. And uh, the numbers are quite great and quite uh, surprising. Um, and this will not go away. Huh? I was looking this weekend at maps of a, a 2% increase in temperature around the world. 2% mm -hmm. increase in temperature around the world will affect 1 million Canadians. 
right? The whole of the southern Vancouver, greater Vancouver region will disappear. Right? So it's between 1.5% or 2%, the, the, the n number of people impacted is quite great. The city of Shanghai, the whole city of Shanghai, it's 48 million people will be underwater. I just looked at places I've been just to have a sense of, you know, even Sapporo in Japan, where I was recently, would be affected. Calcutta in India, the whole region will be affected. We're talking about a place that has like, Calcutta I think is like 18 million people. Um, two thirds of the state of Bangladesh will be affected. So it's quite interesting to look at this. And so when we look at, when we look at this mobility uh, of human beings, right? And when we look at how we deal with it today and how it's bordered, it actually is really relevant to understand the mechanism that we use. It's not just territorial borders. It's how these people can move around the world and how we have put in place this. So borders in globalization is really interesting in this. And there are new technologies that I use, and I just list them here because we always come back to them, right? But the role of um, control and surveillance policies, um, I just discussed market flows, um, mobility, human mobility, uh, the impact of sustainable policies and cultural policies. These are the different things that BIG is looking into and that we have basically um, here again a little bit more basically the idea that when we look at the literature, we have one general understanding is that the way we understand, and I call this, you know, the, the limit, uh, study, study the limits of our understanding of borders as territorial power containers and our castle security strategies and views. So it's the idea that, you know, the idea that states control all of this is actually being undermined today. We have, we have the illusion, basically, that states are able to control these flows. And we we'll stay with it because it's been s being constructed, but it's also being implemented across the world progressively through colonization. And as I will highlight, it's something that has about 100 or so years of existence. But it's not our history, for sure. It's not the history of humanity. And so BIG has wanted to collect data across all these six uh, themes, governance, economic and human flows, history, culture, sec security, and sustainability. So I'm not going to discuss all of this. I'm only discussing um, the end of territory and the state. So I'm just going to pass on that and just get into the lecture right now. So one of the things that I like, and I like these two quotes for this, even though J.R. Diamond has always been kind of um, you know, put aside of the academic community because he's been so successful, but in, in, in selling books, generally selling books, right? Uh, because he sold millions of volumes. Um, but he has some really interesting insight that even concern the kind of things that we study, like the world until yesterday in the book, uh, the world until yesterday. He talks about, you know, early uh, civilization and, and how they were basically bordering territory. And he says borders in traditional societies result from the relationship between sense of belonging to the mountains, to the rivers, technological differentiation, trade of rare objects like shells, right, and population density. Yet borders move and populations are displaced. In other words, early civilizations had a sense of what borders were all about, and we can start thinking about whether they are borders or frontiers, or borderlands, border regions, and frontiers. And I'll discuss this a bit more. But also the idea that maybe they're not such well-defined boundary lines, and that the precision is something that comes later. Historically, this would really help us understand a lot of things, including the writing of colleagues. And then the other quote, which I like quite a bit, is Norman Davis, right? I was born a subject of the British Empire, and as a child read that our empire was on and on, which the sun never sets. Reality believed um, outward appearance of unlimited power and per permanence. And so what we see here is that 
He is aware of the fact that the empire is as vast as the world. And today, as an older scholar, he's a very respected Oxford Don, by the way. Um, you know, you look at the United Kingdom and you wonder where the empire is. It's subdividing, right? And there are all kinds of issues there. So basically, the idea that even, and especially empires, have subdivided. And that's a really important part. I'm not going to discuss, for instance, the history of war today, but I might raise it in other seminars. But just to illustrate this for the three of you, for the three students who are in the room here, the MPA students, what is really interesting in what Norman Davis says to us is that when we look at the history of wars for the last 200 and, uh, and a bit more years, like since the 1800, the history of wars, right, worldwide, what we see is that most of the wars, seven out of eight wars, right, so that's more than 90% of all the occurrences of war ever documented in the history of wars worldwide, happened within subdividing empires, countries, kingdoms, republics, and so on and so forth. They are very rarely in between, you know, wars that happen between two empires or three empires but they almost always happen at first as a civil casualty or a number of civil casualties. So they are, they, are, they are wars within a political envelope, within a political unit, within a member of the international community. And so I think this is really interesting because it shows that um, state, the idea of the state or the territorial state is something that is really not really that permanent. And yet, you know, when we look at this from the perspective of one's life, 50 years to 80 years, we, we lose that sense. We think that, you know, there is permanence in the existence of the boundaries of Canada, of the US, of Mexico, of Colombia, of different European countries. But it's an ongoing work, actually, to maintain that permanence, right? It's very, very difficult. And so today, I kind of want to discuss these two different themes. It's how early societies basically design what we call today boundary lines, the line that separates powers, states, and also the idea that states as territories and spaces can subdivide. Or they can grow, but they can also basically be unsuccessful and become very small again or very different again. So why, if I can interrupt, yeah. why do you, uh, maybe you could say why you put the heading as the agency of borders? Oh, it's because I think, um, <laughs> it's because I think borderlanders have much to say in the position of the border. And that when we study borders, we don't look at borderlanders. Actually, historically, we have completely ignored borderlanders. When you read the book of Mar Margaret Macmillan, 1919, you know, on the P Paris Treaty negotiations, you have five powers, three of which really speak, the US, the Brits, and the French. And they are subdividing the world, and they're organizing the world according to the, the war they just won. And they basically decide to you know, um, lay out the foundation of a new era. It's one of the most important treaty, actually, with regard to the the current world, the modern world within which we live. And they have embassies that come from all over the place. Most of them are embassies that come from you know, um, different regions and different sections of different parts of the empire th that they are subdividing. And they completely disregard, almost systematically, people's submissions or communities or political community submissions. What they look at if you can guess, railways, harbors, access oil. to the sea, oil, basic mineral access, and wealth that is in the ground. And that's all. People had almost no influence whatsoever on um, these decisions. And, and people will say, well, it was 1919, no wonder. You know, we were at a period which was not even in we, have n we had not even entered the decolonization period, right? We were at the summit of the colonization period, which starts really unraveling by the time of the Second World War. 
But historically, I think it's really important to become aware of this, is that today, when Woodrow Wilson presents to Congress his 14 points, talking about self-determination as a way to, to basically um, create the foundation of the new order, and everybody laughs at him in Paris when he comes up with this idea, and then he goes back to the US and comes back a few months later, and the, the idea is like, okay, we won't, we won't use self-determination as one of the principles. One of the, one of the sub, one of the, underlying argument behind the ag agency of border is to say, well, now we pay the price because, you know, self-determination big time is certainly on everybody's mind and it's on the mind both of the most powerful states and empire as it is, and they, they try to use the system in place to implement this, but it's also on the mind of every single nation as small as a few hundred that wants independence from any kind of members of the international community, right? And I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but that's just the beginning for, for the answer. It's the idea that borderlanders have never been consultants. Yeah, I've just been like the agency of borders and the realizing, of course, a shorthand for agency of people near borders. Borderlanders. Borderlanders. Is that okay? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so... One of the things that we start with is, and I love this picture, I put it together about f the year that before I won Borders in Globalization, I had to do a presentation on a research program um, at Durham University. And I'm still quite grateful to them actually because I spent four months basically reading uh, four banker boxes full of, um, mm -hmm. full of documentation. Um, and. Uh, and I explained, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating here, in the middle in black and white you have Ur, which is one of the oldest human settlement ever. It's about 7,000 years old. And then you have Carcassonne, which is still, a, you know, one of the early, early medieval cities, intact inside out, right, which is quite amazing. It's in the southwest of France. And then you have, you have um, uh, the China Wall, you have the Adrian Wall, and you have... Um, uh, Jenny, which is one of the cities in northern Mali, which nobody can go to today unless you do research with ISIS. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, at first we basically build walls. So the way we organize territory is by building walls. And it gives us a sense of space, but it, I think conceptually it's quite interesting to think that, you know, walls, even before the rule of law, basically were a way to organize territory. If I build a wall, if I fence anything, whether it's a city, um, er early Sumerian civilization with walled cities, for instance, like Ur and some other ones later, um, until fairly recently, walls basically determinated and organized territory and power. So I think it's kind of a nice way to look at this. And it's kind of the reference that I have to trying to understand space, and um, what it allows us to limit space or to claim space, right? Or to use space as a, um, as a, a um, place where identity, uh, uh, nationhood, um, indigeneity can be formed and can be rooted into. So humans, when we look at history here, we have humans that have fenced themselves for thousands of years. And I, you know, one of the things that I, I say about this is that it's probably a process that has, that is as, ho as ho old as the uh, agrarian revolution. So it's about 10,000 years old. It, it's, and the, the rationale behind this is that when you start seeding, you have to come back to the same place regularly. And also when you clean, you clean, clean up the land and you start seeding, you actually also want to harvest. Otherwise, what would you seed? And yet, you know, if you're if you are a, uh, um, uh, a civilization of people who always move, then there there are issues with with um, <coughs> being able to to um, to control the land. And so, when we look at the first cities, we have a sense. And when we look at first Me Mesopotamian cities, what we see is that. We, we, we have a sense that something is happening, yet 
especially around Mesopotamian cities, which are walled, you, you notice that um, fields are not always walled. In other words, the core of the, of the, um, the, 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 core of the, the urban space is walled, but then the fields apart are not walled in the same way. And so in urban civilization, the first urban civilization, what we have is walled cities with some ideas that what's outside the city is the possession of the city and the city allow people to defend it. But that's basically what we have. And what I'm getting at here is that the idea of the wall and the ability to document the possession is at stake here. How do you protect your seeds? You know that Sumer Sumerian civilization, for instance, were mathematical civilization. They counted the number of seeds that were used for um, agricultural purposes. So, so when you seeded a certain space, you actually were given a very specific number of seeds, which shows you a rational, which had to do with you know owning the space, controlling the space, seeding the space, and ha harvesting the space, which I think is really interesting. But the first technology, in a way we could say, had to do with building walls, and then it's something that I think is important here. And it's not been written per se, so we don't have much literature on this, but this idea that at one point, the wall becomes a legal document. And that's what I see happening in the, civili in the seminarian civilization with the Stella of Vilter, which is basically a treaty between two cities and establishes the boundary line between the two cities over a war that had to do with both land and water, right? But establishes basically um, and, and um, establishes in a way the first technologies. The rule of law allows us to understand in a way uh, the, the limit. We establish a limit. Now, when we have a wall or when we draw a map, and when, you know, obviously it, it will have different dimensions. Some of you may have, may have drafted maps. You know the thickness of the pen is something that we have to take into account. This is something I always come back to. But if you look at the green line between the Palestinian territories and the city of Jerusalem today, right? There is a highway that divides the two. That's the green line. It's a highway. It's a four-lane highway. And it's been abused by Israel as a state because it's the boundary line. So why not go all the way from one end of the boundary line to the other one? And so you have a segment of the highway from the south of Israel. I think you probably know that highway. At some point, it goes under tunnels, and then it reappears up. Right? That part, before it enters the tunnel, that part is actually exactly a segment of the green line. And so I'm thinking what we have here is actually the first technology that humans have ever used to draft, in a way, an agreement between two cities and two, um, two different spaces, if you want. But the precision, the detail, as how thick the line is, is another question, right? So the first technology is certainly the rule of law. And one of the things that we can say about this is that it's still with us. The rule of law is still with us. We're still working on rule of law. We're still using the rule of law to subdivide and to control and to filter movement between territories or across territories. And I would say the second technology was maps. But it doesn't happen right away. And this is why I really like this Portland me map. It's actually a 16th century copy that I picked up off of the website. But Ptolemy was one of the Greek um, uh, map makers and you know, philosophers at the time. And if you look at this map very carefully, you, you, you have colleagues who are historians of maps that have even designed, for instance, the first Sumerian maps were maps that looked at what we call the south as their north. But this, this map, I really like it because you, when you look carefully at how it designs the Mediterranean Sea and the rest of the world, you realize that the big picture is like, you know, almost right. I mean, if you know 
the coast of northern Africa and you compare it to what you have here, you would say, well, it's certainly not straight like this and it doesn't work that well. But you can still see, you know, Italy <coughs> shaped out. You can still see a little bit, um, you know, the um, uh, Greece shaped out. You can still see Spain and Portugal basically correctly. But one of the big issues with that map is that it's not very accurate. And the reason that map is not as accurate as the maps we have today is that people looked at stars at the time to design maps. In one of the, in one of the readings that we have to t for today, the author hesitates as to how is it that, I'm coming back to this later, but how is it that suddenly from, you know, d what he calls discrete borders, we have much more precise borders that allow for a fence to be built in and imposed. And sometimes the fence even divides the same people. In this map, you have the answer in a way, is that historically, we were completely unable to be highly accurate. We, we were not able to actually define where the boundary lines were, because even coasts were not very well defined. So the two technologies that we have, at one point there is something that changes. And I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. But um, um, I'll show you. This is the Harrison clock. I'll come back to this later. But the Harrison clock changes everything. So we have one technology, which is the rule of law. And at first, it's, a, it's used for two cities or kingdoms, so international treaties basically are there. And then we have maps that allow us to depict, in a way, the possession of the powers of the world. And I have given talks, and I have the maps, if you want to, to show you the evolution of the depiction of the world from, from, from about um, um, 1100 all the way to 2000. And it's quite interesting to see how the number of powers that control the world basically increases from just a few to today, as you know, uh, 192, 93 in the UN. Uh, conceptually, however, there is something that happens that is very important, which is the Westphalia and the creation of what we call, you know, the, the, the modern era of states today. 1648, it's the end of a very complex war across Europe. Um, and Westphalia is actually two treaties. And uh, one of the idea here is that um, you have, in a way, um, <coughs> um, what I would call a conceptual revolution, which is the idea is that lawyers suddenly realize that foes can become partners in times of peace, and that treaty can really allow them to do this. One part of the treaty has to do with map making and has to do with the delineation of the empires. So what we have here is, uh, with, with Westphalia, the first international agreement or multi-party um, multi agreements, uh, where we have a multiplicity of states that agree um, to their sovereignty, to their, um, to their um, own uh, territories or on space. And uh, really what is interesting here is obviously the, the idea that you can negotiate this and then put it in, in law and then map it out. So with Westphalia, we have this, all of these processes coming together. <coughs> right. I'm going to come back to this um, in a, a, a few more details later. The big picture above is the signature. The, the, the painting is the signature of Westphalia, and the map is um, you know, a depiction of all the parties involved, so all the powers involved in the signature of Westphalia, which, is, which, is, um, which shows you, you know, how, how complex the whole issue was for, for so many different powers. Now, one of the technology that changes um, precision is the Harrison clock. For the longest time, we were able to use um, a sextance, 
to basically follow stars and to stay basically always accurate on, on um, and I never remember if it's the longitude or the latitude, but one of the two. And suddenly with the clock, we're able to measure the latitude very, very specifically. And so instead of having lines that are uh, you know, imprecise, because of the clock, the Harrison clock, which doesn't lose any time as you are crossing many um, 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 areas of time differences, right? As you are crossing across the sea, you are able to know exactly where you are. So it is because of the Harrison clock that we can, for the first time in the history of humanity, make points on a map rather than having lines. And so suddenly we have, in a, it, you know, in a way, for me, we have a technological transformation where you have bo both the law allowing for treaties to exist and at the same time the depiction mm -hmm. of the boundary lines to be extremely accurate. So think about it this way. From maps that are not precise, we're able to, be, to make maps that become much more precise, that are very accurate. What does this mean for us when we study boundary lines or when we study boundaries? It means that in our own mind, a space or reference to um, a geography like a forest or a river or a mountain now can be as precise as a line. And it means that the mapping technology becomes a reference or one of the reference in treaty making. So if you read, for instance, the French-Spanish um, agreement for the establishment of the P Pyrenees, <coughs> the boundary across the Pyrenees, the text will make you walk the line. And geographers that are a, ge a, a generation older than I um, know how to describe a boundary line as if they were walking the line. There are few geographers today that still know how to do this, but early geographers still knew how to do this. You walk the line of the boundary line, and you describe the land as you walk. Um, but with that technology, what happens is that progressively you have very precise maps that are becoming the annexes to treaties. They become the, an integral part of the treaties. They become really important because they basically tell you where the boundary is. And if you don't know where the boundary is, you can refer to the earliest legal text or the earliest agreement, but you can also refer to the map, which is something you couldn't do before. So these technologies, mapping and the ability to uh, calculate the longitude and the latitude very precisely, in a way, change our own perception of what a border is. So you know, Romans, for instance, had a sense that they could measure from the core of a city out whose property it was. But the boundary of the empires were always zones or marches or areas. And it is in the boundaries that the legions were established. And sometimes these boundaries had markers. They had stone markers. In some instances, they have stone markers. But they were never conceived as a line, as precisely as a line. They were areas that had been identified as being outside of the empire. So the idea of a zone, I think, after obviously 1800, changes radically. Because you, are, you enter a period where basically map making becomes much more specific. Obviously, today we have GPS, so who cares, right? Because we can calculate a tenth of a millimeter to decide where the boundary line is. But that's not possible in, until you know, the mid-1950s, because the GPS, I think, is from 1954. 
and it's not generalized until fairly recently because now all of us have GPSs, so we're aware of where we are. We can even have it on our phone, but it is a very recent technology. So to summarize what I've just said, I have this to say, is that the idea that borders can be written in treaties from, comes from Hugo uh, Grotius, who writes, you know, de jure belli ad pacis, which basically that warring powers are peers in peace. And so it's the idea that you can use the treaty, the rule of law, to basically organize peace. And that, that is the principle that is used during the Westphalia negotiation, the two treaty negotiation. And, th and that at about 100 years apart, we have the creation of this chronometer. And so with the sextant and the chronometer, we're able to rewrite maps. So what we see is that this is a period of great innovation, but it doesn't really impact the way we understand borders until it's written in a you know, treaty that has a huge impact on the world over, which is the end of the First World War. Before that, we have bits and pieces. We have tons of little treaties. We have this and that in the east, in the west, in the south, in the north, as the world organizes itself around colonization. You know, we have a generalization of this principle, but we don't have this unifying treaty that basically Paris 1919, the, the, the Treaty of, of Versailles organizes. Um, and, the, and this idea that you can generalize the idea that all of this is you know, um, uh, organized on the basis of territorial sovereignty of the members of the international community with the idea of no, you know, no uh, no interferences and the respect of sovereignty and, and uh, you know territorial integrity and self-determination and so on and so forth that comes that are discussed at that time. So this is the book I talked about earlier um, when we look at you know the generalizing system basically map technologies and the generalizing of the law that organized basically the world at that time. For me, this is the foundation. So that this short presentation is the foundation of the system in which or with which we are struggling today. Right? It's a system where um, mapping technology and our understanding of space was fairly imprecise and where the rule of law from a time was very descriptive to a time where now we have much more precise maps and at the same time rule of law that are much more codified and much less descriptive. So when you look at treaties, for instance, now they can make references to maps rather than walk you through the boundary line. Now, how, how can I prove this? Well, if you look at, for instance, um, dispute resolution issues. If you look at the Encyclopedia of Bo or Border Disputes that I edited uh, a few years ago, one of the things that I discovered in doing the case studies, looking at you know all the cases that were that are being have been published in the Encyclopedia, is that you um, we discover that uh, boundary disputes, in other words, the position of the boundary line. Is, a, is very much a post-Second World War issue. Because today we have the technology to say, well, we have this old treaty, and we can't agree about exactly where the boundary line is. We have an idea. And they are really interesting cases, right? Where you have treaties, for instance, in Latin America that talk about um, rivers with island rivers, and the islands are the reference on the, on the treaty to delineate the boundary line, and the islands change with every season. I always talk about this, but we have, for instance, the Dollar Strait, which is a really interesting one between Germany and the Netherlands. It's my favorite one because they are peace countries. They ha they've had the issue for 500 years. With every single season, um, the Talweg changes. And the impact of the Talweg, the Talweg is the lowest possible point in the river, and it changes with every single season. And it never takes the same, 
um, because it depends on how much water will flow through the river, right? But the impact is um, hundreds of kilometers square at sea between Germany and the Netherlands. So the impact is tremendous. The, the end of the line into the sea has tremendous impact on who dominates, in a way, the extension of, of the Talwek. So this period is really interesting because it has given us the tools that we study when we study borders in globalization. We have the tools that are you know, old maps and new maps. So the whole issue of being really precise about where the boundary line is, and the whole issue of the quality of the treaty. Do we have treaties that are very descriptive? Do we have treaties that are much less descriptive and how, it, how, how this um, goes uh, forward? And obviously, we have what I started with because of Michael's question, which is the whole issue of self-determination. In, uh, at the time of uh, the Paris Treaty, um, you know, very, um, and then when we look at scholarship as well, um, you know, borderlands and borders generally were never studied from the perspective of people and communities. And to this day, I think in the international community, it's a huge issue. I mean, when you look at how certain communities have been told that they have to demonstrate the ability to self-determine. I'm thinking about the Kurds, for instance, last year, all the negotiations and the pressure from the international community to say, well, are you going to be able to elect, you know, are you going to be able to form government and so on and so forth? And then it's used against them. It's used against them even though the world over knows that the Kurds exist as a people and that it's you know, and they and, and, and they know it so well that but still it's used against them. And so what we what we see here is that not only the idea has existed for a long time, but it's also been in a way um, minimized for a long time. The whole idea of self determination is a really difficult threshold to pass for borderlanders or for communities that are at the margins of the members of the international community. Yet, and I'm going to detail this a little bit now, when we look at this history, we, we realize that, well, at the end of the Second World War, the UN is put in place because of um, the Second World War, because the international community needs uh, you know, to have institutions of partnership. And the role of the UN at first is to organize cooperation amongst the nation. It's called the United Nations. Right? <coughs> and I always think, you know, it's, isn't it interesting that it's called the United Nations? It's not, it's not an accident if it's been called the United Nations, right? But one of the things that I find the most interesting is that the first top priority of the mission of the United Nations, including the, the strengthening of the power of the International Court of Justice, is to organize peaceful decolonization worldwide. And so when you look at the number of states that appear during the first 35 years of the existence of the United Nations, so until the 1980s, basically, you see an incredible number of subdivisions and decolonizations. Most of them are basically, you know, progressive decolonization of states. And I, I like the number here because it, it's, you know, a progression. But I also say that when we look at these 150 new members uh, countries or new member states of the United Nations, one of the things that I find really interesting is that when you look at the reports of the UN on decolonization and you look at 150, the UN only helped for the decolonization of about half of them because the other ones are actually self-determined states. So they have led to some form of almost war in cer certain cases, right? The latest one is actually, I think, one of the not 
exemplary, but not atypical at all. Sudan, South Sudan, the story goes on. It's still very, very difficult. There are periods of peace that are succeeded by periods of war, tensions, and who suffers in the end? The people. But the point I want to make here is that we have a demography of states. We actually have a growing number of states. We see that from 47 members all the way to 198. I, I push the numbers a little bit because I include in the 198, I do include Palestine and I include, you know, I go beyond 193, which is the exact number. But if I wanted to push my luck a little bit more, as I did in the, in the uh, big database, I said to include 22 territories that have at least one member of the international community that has recognized them. So they are not members of the United Nations, but they are certainly not areas that have no credibility whatsoever at the international level. They do. So what we see here is, is that, you know, that part of BIG, which I think is really interesting, is the progressive, and this is the list of all the states. So from 1946, with 45, 55 members, all the way to 2000, and I can't read myself there, 2011 with 193 members. And s most years, you have at least one new state, sometime more. <coughs> so for instance, you know, 1948, Burma, 1949, Israel, 1950, Indonesia. 1955, you have a whole large number that appears there. Um, 1956, Japan, Morocco, Sudan, Tunisia. So it's quite interesting to see that, you know, these, we, we assume that, for instance, Japan has always been a member of the international community. Japan has always been part of, has its own empire. It was not a member of the international community. It was under um, the supervision of the U.S. for a number of years. I mean, you know, we, we have completely forgotten this, um, and so on and so forth. So it's just a way for me to illustrate how incredibly versatile these, these things are happening and how also when we study borders, when we study what divides these territories, we are called to question um, some of the processes that are going on here. Now the talk today is really about boundary line versus borders versus frontier. And I will conclude on this. I will come back to some of the, so, some of the reading for today. Um, I've al I'm almost at uh, 50 minutes of talking, so I wanted to talk 45 minutes. But I'll just say this much. One of the things that I think we learn from history is this, is that territory is something that moves. Territory is not fixed in time or even in space. And that when we look at the, ev the evolution we can say that over the last 100 years, so since 1919, about, we have had a system that has been contained. But can we say that it has not evolved? Certainly not. The system has subdivided greatly. We have many more um, you know, political spaces that are self-determined. And they have been recognized by the international community. So we have a lot of documentation to say that you know self-determination has increased fa fragmentation. And to speak bluntly, one of the things that I think is fascinating is this idea that what we call the castle, or you know you can call this as a, a, a as a allegory, the castle subdivides, the state subdivides into smaller units, and. And the political containers that the states are, the members of the international communities are, are very, are very interesting. But they keep on subdividing, despite the institutions that link them together and in a way enforces uh, a world order onto them. So for the future of, of borders in globalization, studying this remains really important. Because I believe that both indigeneity and where indigeneity comes from, 
and nationhood, but also issues of nationalism, lead to this spatial, ongoing spatial transformation of the world. And right now, we're in a period where increased fragmentation can be a very strong hypothesis because it's not held back. At least we don't have the data to prove that it's held back. I have not seen the number of members of the international community come down since 1946. Not one year has it come down. And the number of territories that want to be self-determined and are pushing for more independence is greater than ever. And then at the same time, it is being tampered by another movement, which is territorial, which is the idea that states tend to decentralize power to negotiate, in a way, power with their peripheries. This became very, very clear to me a few years ago when I was, giving, I was invited to give a talk in Morocco, and I discovered that you know, in Morocco you have different regions, but you also have different ethnies, different people who do not understand politics the same way. And the big divide there was between obviously the Sahrawis, people from the southern part of Morocco all the way to Mauritania, and the rest of the kingdom. But what is really fascinating though is to discover that between people who call themselves as, um, you know, Arabs, from the conquest and the Sahrawis, you also have a lot of ethnies in the middle that live in the high atlases. And they want to have more independence. So what has the kingdom done? It has divided Morocco in different regions, and it is decentralizing power. So we have these two movements, in a way, political movements of self-determination and also renegotiations of the relationships that in a way are really interesting for us to, to use. Now, I'm going to come back to some of these ideas with two of the readings. And the two readings that I want to look at is uh, A New Borders on the Mind, and then Daniel Power, The Frontier, The Term, Concept, and Historians. And then we can have a discussion. So I really like the reason I, talk, I decided to take Power is that he talks about he basically tells us, well, what is a frontier and how do people in the Middle Ages understood a border, you know, a frontier? And then he starts by telling us that historians have, you know, written a lot on this. And he illustrates this, you know, geographically, politically, culturally, economically, linguistically, right, racially, and gender. They're all kind of different frontiers. But they're all based, originally, they're all based on discrete places. So the best way I can explain this territorially is to basically say that pre-modern, pre-modern, if you were looking at a border at the, time, at the time that he studies, if you were one of the people, you know, thinking about borders at the time that he studies, it's very rare that you have a clear boundary line or a clear limit. You may have it in certain conditions. It's a river that is well encased within a given geography. In other words, it doesn't overflow. And you have a sense that that river, which is not a line, by the way, it can be mile it can be f a few miles wide, but let's assume, you know, it's a fairly small river, 100 meters wide, for instance. Well encased would be something that, or oh, it's a coastline. But even in cases like this, you get a sense that, you know, obviously the boundary line is quite wide. It can be a mountain top as well. And I'll illustrate this for a sec. Think about a mountain top. What is the mountain top? What would be the best way to understand 
where you are on the mountain top if you're walking on ice. So you're top of a mountain between Tibet and China, or between Nepal and China, or between Nepal, it's more difficult between Nepal, Nepal and India, but between Nepal or Bhutan and China, or Nepal and China, or Nepal and Bhutan, and you want to determine which side of the mountain is China and which side of the mountain is India. And you know that it is the mountain top. Well, the legal case for this is you look at where the water flows. You look at where the water flows. So if the water flows on one side, you know that's the Indian side, it's there. But you know the issue with this, with climate change? Mm -hmm. It can vary by hundreds of meters because the snow and the ice also moves until you reach the land. And as it does this, it erodes the land as well. So the old way to understand borders, as is described by Daniel Power, is on discrete consideration, not precise line, as they are today. And what are discrete considerations? Well, they are multiple. Here he uses different words. It's in the conclusion. I thought it was very well summarized. A frontier was formed from a conjunction of many coexisting institution, practices, institutions, ideologies, and so on. How precise can that be? But it was never, it was never a line. <coughs> See, the idea of a line, and this is why I like the history part, the idea of a line is something, and this is why all the work that Randy has done for us is wonderful, because every single paper, and I'm not asking you to read them, but he's published, he's worked on at least seven or eight that I've read. In every single one of them is a questioning of the role of the boundary line, whether he looks at economy, transportation, whatever he's looking at. Every single time he says, OK, so how malleable the boundary line can be, right? He's not, and, and what I like is that, you know, Randy is a historian, so we learn it from the historians. And then the economists, like, you know, Shaming Shan in Border Bands, his book, like the, one of the books that I like the most, talks, talks about how borders can be bent, even as institutions today, because basically states will renegotiate whether they should be porous or not. He talks about, um, you know, Malaysian borders as being basically completely porous and so on and so forth. But anyway, the point I want to make, which is very important to us, is that the idea of a boundary line is a modern idea. It's a very modern idea that is technologically determined. If we don't have this, we don't understand it. And I think, you know, with regard, for instance, to the internet, that's a huge question. Because what is a border in the internet? Then it's something that is technologically defined. And so we need to think about it the critically that way. See, in the modern world, it has been possible to divide communities with concrete and barbed wire, regardless of the inhabitant views. That's also, I mean, you can see that I'm picking up my citations carefully, even if I don't retranscribe them very carefully. The idea is the same as the title of the presentation, which is that, for me, the role of borderlanders is something that we have, in a way, forgotten in history, but as a result of which, we still are studying what borderlanders, from the perspective of the state. You know, if you look at borders from the view of a state, you're thinking, look at what they're doing with my borders. They're challenging them all the time. They're redrafting them. They're telling me that they are po not properly placed. And I think that's really interesting. So the way I understand that convoluted sentence, a frontier was formed from a conjunction of many coexisting institutions, practices, institutions, ideologies, and so on, it was conceived in linear and zonal terms. The best way I can understand this is, you know, the alliances that small fiefdom would have had with each other, 
in compact, sometime not in compact, so they were geographically contiguous and all in agreement that they belonged to an empire or another, and then sometime they could not agree. So you take a multiplicity of cities with their peripheries in the old idea of summer, like the, Sumer, the, the, the Sumerian civilization, the idea that you have a multiplicity of cities with their peripheries, and they all agree to belong to one space, one empire, or they don't. And then you have fragmented borderlands, warring borderlands even. But these are what I would call the, the discrete Right? It's that it has nothing to do with the line. It is negotiated. It is ideological. It is a set of practices. It can be predetermined by things as simple as traditional fishy, uh, fishery, uh, sorry, fisheries. You know, what community will have the right to access the sea and how do we share the sea between islanders? and so on and so forth. So these are things that are really always negotiated and renegotiated. So precision obviously helps us tremendously, right? The idea of the modern idea of precision is fabulous because it really helps us divide the world. But it also, in a way, blinds us that the precision is just an illusion, in a way, technological illusion. It can help us fix things once and for all. Yet the rule of law here uses precision to the extent that it works. For instance, the, 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 the different tests that the, 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 the International Court of Justice uses, for instance, to divide a maritime space. So you are in the middle of the sea between you, uh, Bolivia, it's Bolivia and Peru. It's Bolivia and Peru. Or it, no, 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 it's <coughs> Bolivia and Chile, or Peru and Chile. It's Bolivia and Chile, right? The, the latest case in, in, no, in uh, Latin America. Uh, Colombia and uh, Nicaragua. No, oh no, that's the most recent one. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about one that I used in one of my courses. But anyway, what they do is they, they look at sea, they have the treaties and they look at sea and they, des they design large spaces and then they can be super specific because it's at sea. But as soon as you do this on land and you have individuals, people, histories, sometimes thousands of years, symmetries, what do I know? You know, um, religious sites that have always existed with people. People don't forget. It goes on. It's, that, it's, like, it's not just the culture. It's the history which rewrites that boundary line. It's the history that challenges the concrete and the barbed wire. John and you's paper, I thought, was kind of really interesting because um, he is trying to get at something quite um, sophisticated, right? He's trying to make us think about borders differently. And he says, well, borders are like dwellings. I don't know if I like the word dwelling, but certainly it's quite interesting to think that a border can be a dwelling rather than a national space. It's like something that you could carry with you. Right? It could be like a tent is a dwelling. And then to see as a political responsibility to pursue decent life. And then as soon as I read decent life, I thought, OK, Agamben, right there. So in other words, it's the idea that you know, a border is something that you can carry with you, and that would be respected worldwide, or would have some implication out there. right? It is linked to territory, for sure. And it is linked to some form of power, for sure. This is why certain citizenship carry more rights to travel than others. We all know this. Certain nations, certain, certain citizenship will not allow you to even leave your own country. Certain passports don't allow you to, to travel very much. Other pa passports will give you the right to travel without visas to you know, well over 150 countries. Obviously, if we are Canadian, 
we have never traveled to the extent that our passport allows us to, unless we're very wealthy and have a lot of time on our hands to explore every single country that the passport allows us to go to. But if we're a busy Taiwanese businessman and we know that we need to apply for visa for almost every single country of the world, but maybe 20, we're really aware of this, let alone if we have, you know, a Palestinian, or worse than that, we have no passports. That's most Palestinians. That's most Palestinians, indeed. So this, obviously, when we study borders, are things that we are not really thinking about, but that are extremely real to some people, which is what he's getting at, right? He says this, um, borders as dwelling rather than national spaces, and to see political responsibility of pursuit of decent light as extending beyond the border of any particular states. Borders matter then because they have real effect and because they trap, and he expands this idea even more, thinking about and acting in the world in, ter in territorial terms. In other words, they border us those borders. They allow us to think outside the box, or they constrain us even physically on a piece of land, and we can't ever leave it. So I thought that's kind of an interesting way to start that. And then he looks at different categories of, of borders, the enabling and the disenabling border. And I thought, you know, here is kind of it interesting to see at how he looks at those. Note that in this case, he's not really looking at a boundary line. What is he looking at specifically when he extrapolates like this on the enabling border or the disabling border? I think he's looking at regulatory borders. He's looking at the impact of the rule of law and how certain territories have basically allowed for a maximization or a demultiplication of the power of the rights of their citizens versus others. In a way, borders carry with them a worldwide inequality. Right? Certain borders allow you, because you carry them with you, if they are a dwelling, according to him, then they create this. This is why I kind of summarized it in disabling border as these results from international regimes of rights that give or take away bundles of rights from people and categorize. Right? So it's not that you're Canadian. It's that you are a, an ec economic migrant versus a asylum seeker for the European Union. So the economic migrant who is illegal has no rights. The asylum seeker, who has proven his case or her case, has the rights of the poorest of the European citizens, has the right to a blue card, has the right to social security, education, has the right to shelter, and has the right to minimum wage or welfare, which is kind of what you would get if you are. And so this is really interesting to us, I think, because this is the idea that it may be rooted in a given territory, but it projects power outside of that territory. But it also applies to you know, the way we think about this. And then he concludes, kind of interestingly, borders raise the problem. I mean, that's the way I summarize the third case, where he, he uh, mentions Mark Salter and you know, the more negotiated borders that Mark um, Salter has discussed in his writing raise the problem of open borders or global redistributive justice, which for us might be actually a huge challenge, but I don't know if I want to go there in terms of research right now. It's the idea that you could have open borders and I an ideal. The open borders and an ideal means that every human being has rights of mobility. Or you could have really global redistributive pact where every human has right to what he calls earlier, I'm going to have to go back here, decent life, which are the, you know, the rights that you cannot strip humans from, which we are doing currently on a regular basis.
So here we're not talking about a boundary line. We have a new dimension, which I think is very important because big and borders and globalization, we have actually looked at this very carefully and I think we have a lot of evidence. But I want to, to, to do more research on this, obviously, in the future, is the whole idea that the boundary line, in a way, is not enough. We actually have to understand what is the border as a dwelling. And also we have to understand if all borders as dwellings are always rooted in territory. And I will tell you under uh, Benjamin's control that I believe that now we are making borders that are not territorial extensions anymore. The global borders today are only negotiated and the states are a minority when they discuss them. So the global nexus, when it defines certain security standards, when the private sector, the nonprofit, and the states negotiate together global rules, they superimpose and minimize the impact and the power of the territorial boundaries that we've just discussed, or the bundles of rights that we've just discussed that um, John and you makes reference to.